Okay, and so thank you so much. Um, we're gonna get started with Into the Wild, embracing the interdisciplinary art practice with Felita Hicks. Felita Hicks is a poet, essayist, and dis interdisciplinary artist. The former editor-in-chief of Borderlands Texas Poetry Review, they are the author of Hood Witch, a finalist for the 2020 Lambda Literary Award for Bisexual Poetry, the 2019 Balcones Poetry Prize, and shortlisted for the 2019 Julie Suck Award. They have been awarded fellowships and res residencies from Tin House, Lambda Literary, Jack Jones, Literary Arts, and The Right of Return, USA the first fellowship designed exclusively for previously incarcerated artists. Their poetry, essays, interviews, performances, and photography have been featured in or, or forthcoming in Adroit, American Poetry Review, Brave New Films, The Cincinnati Review, The Cut, Electric Lit, Friction, Fr Frontier Poetry, HuffPost, Kenyon Review, Lone Star Lit, Long Reads, Palette Poetry, PBS Independent Lens, Poetry Magazine, Poetry Daily, Poets and Writers, Prairie Schooner, the Rumpus, Slate, Texas Observer, Texas Monthly, Vice, Vida Review, and others. Hicks received an MFA in creative writing from Sierra Nevada University and is currently working on a multimedia project about pretrial criminal policy in the Southwest. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Felita Hicks. Thank you so much, Felita. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having the patience to read that whole thing there. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, of course. It's such an impressive bio. Um, okay, and so I'm going to turn my camera off, but I am here if you need anything. Um, and I will see y'all again for the Q&A. Thanks. Let baby. me make sure I, there we go, share screen. There yeah. we go. And as soon as it lets me, there we go. Hi, everyone. So in this screen, I cannot see your questions, but I will definitely go back over them. Um, one thing I want to say is the reason why I put all of those places where my work is forthcoming or has been featured is to let you know that it took me many, many years to accept the fact that I was an interdisciplinary artist and not just a poet. Um, and after like going through all of the things I've done, I was like, oh, all right, so there's a name for what I like to do, which is combine um, words with different projects, and that's interdisciplinary art. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Now, I've just finished crafting this thing. Hopefully, everything works. Um, if you have any questions or comments, Sam can definitely tap in and let me know. This is a quote from Gloria Anzaldúas, uh, the author of Borderlands La Frontera. I stand at the edge where earth touches ocean, where the two overlap, a gentle coming together. And the reason why I included this quote is because I definitely feel as though uh, that's what the interdisciplinary art form is. It's two different things coming together, blending in a way that is poignant. So let's take a look at this next slide. Oh, nope, went too fast. Whoop. So what I like to say about interdisciplinary art is that it's defined by the idea. The poem can live beyond its original design. It can evolve into a photograph or a line of music or a sculpture. To limit how a poem can live in the world is to limit ourselves. Now, when I say poem, I definitely mean any form of written word. Uh, if you're writing a short story, if you're writing a novel, um, if you're writing creative nonfiction, it can live past whatever our original intent was. The first thing to think about when you want to translate something that's written into another art form is what the message is. Are you wanting to evoke a certain emotion? Are you wanting to evoke a certain idea? Are you wanting to uh, evoke a, a certain time period? Are you wanting to evoke a certain um, empathy in whoever your listener or viewer or reader is? Once you have an idea what the message is, you can now think about medium. For some people, that medium is gonna be photography. I see that some people in the chat are actually uh, doing watercolor painting, which I have never mastered, so kudos to you. Um, it could result in a video, as several of our artists have done in this presentation. It could result in music. Um, the medium is really up to you. Uh, there are some fabrics, there are some sculptures. It's however you wanted to interpret it into another medium. 
Once you do that, you want to think about the significance of that item. What do you want to talk about when creating something different? Why would you choose more than one medium to tell a story? And most of the time, it's to address all of the different things that come into a story. If I want to tell a story, like in this video, uh, it's about homelessness in the city of Austin in particular. So why did I have to make a video to go with the poem? Why couldn't I just let the poem do the work by itself? And I realized it's because I was using a lot of metaphor and I was using a lot of images that were hard for my readers to grasp. So I wanted to do something that would give them a little bit more example of what I was talking about. So I drove through Austin and I drove through uh, San Marcos, which is about 30 minutes out of Austin, uh, where I live. And I actually visited some of the bus stops where I was homeless at one point, uh, trying to bring those images into the poem. And then you have to think about the life cycle of whatever it is you're creating. For some people, um, they wanna talk about eco, the ecosystem. They wanna talk about climate change. They might create a poem that's then translated into something that's going to be biodegradable. They might uh, create something that's going to be like a tree that's planted and it's going to have some sort of significance later on in life. There definitely is a project where uh, writers from this century are being put into a capsule and their writing is going to be put into a tree or their writing is going to be printed on the materials from trees that will not exist for another hundred years. It's a big project. Nobody knows what they're writing. Ocean Vong just had a piece that was put in there um, and several others. So now all I'm going to do is give you an example of my film. It was a 72 hour film festival, which meant that I had 72 hours to put together an entire video. And this is what came out of that. Strange. You start to wonder if you're even alive. You start to wonder if this is it. Have you finally come to the end? And you don't know. You fell off. There's no way to know. There's no way to know what's coming. You fell off. In the morning, perhaps there's no way to turn. If there had been nowhere to go. Is a morning. Everything no longer makes sense. Right seems to make sense. Everything. This city. Charges after sundown. Strange. A gritty core for each eye. It is well. All the alleyways belly up the dungeons. You start to wonder if you're even alive. From their creaking offices you start to wonder if this is it. Faces of those Have you finally here. come to the end? Drunk and you don't know. The cardboard cow. There's no way to know. There's no way to know what's coming from the festering of the holes to crap at hands. If there is a fight, it is a morning. Clipping cockroach and bricks in the sad streets and eyes. All right, so uh, not sure why it's double talking there, but we're going to go ahead and stop it there and go to the next one. Okay. <laughs> Go to the next one. So if you've had a chance to see Claudia Rankine today, that was awesome. It was at Book People. Uh, we're going to use Claudia Rankine as like a, a, just a kind of base for us to evaluate language and how that can be translated into image or how that can be translated into video. Um, defying genre. Citizen is uh, Claudia Rankine's book that came out in 2014. That book included several images and um, concepts that were already created by other artists, but the inclusion of those images created something entirely new. Citizen, which has been shortlisted for the National Book Award, suggests that a contemporary American lyric is a weave of artfully juxtaposed intensities, a quarrel with thin form about form. And that's what we're looking at here. Just Us, which is the new book that just came out, does that and does that to the zenith. Um, this work is actually combining poetry, essays, visual, scholarship, analysis, invective, and argument into a passionate and persuasive case about many of the complex mechanics of race in this country. Um, 
I know that not everyone has these books, which is why I've gotten some examples for you. You can see curated images juxtaposed with text on 80 mat coded paper and ranking citizen. The reason why I included the type of paper that this is printed on is to emphasize that the book that was created by Claudia Rankine was not simply a book of poems or a book of poems and images, but is itself a piece of artwork. And that's something to think about. How can you um, provide multiple levels to the work that you're doing? How can it be more than a poem? How can it be more than an image? Uh, making sure that the medium, which is the book, is able to encompass both the images and the text is something that Claudia does very well. Um, here we've got pages 18 and 19 from uh, Citizen. And that picture is actually the picture of uh, a sculpture that was created by Claudia Rankine. It's a little scary to look at, <laughs> and I can't make that bigger for you, but um, it was an infant caribou hide, foam, clay, pins, thread, and rubber eyes. So whenever you're creating something, especially if you're one of those people who likes, has a bunch of knickknacks and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna make this a piece of art. It's important to include all the different parts um, that you're using to pull together this, this final piece, right? That's what we wanna know. What, what created the final piece that we got to see? Um, here we see that uh, Toyen Odutolo, Tola, uh, had created this uncertain yet reserved photo. Uh, it's actually pen and ink. Uh, pen ink and acrylic ink on board. And I do believe that this was a mural at one point in an airport in Detroit. Uh, we also have Carrie Mae Weems, Blue Black Boy was printed on silver print with text on matte. Um, the silver print is kind of a shiny film uh, and it helped to emphasize the coloring that you see on the pages uh, for these photos. This last one is the one that I'm most interested in, and that's because it takes the text that Claudia Rankine has created, and it combines it with images. I'm interrupted from reading Claudia's text by this image here. I don't know if you guys can actually see me pointing at it. Let's see if I can get my pointer going. Nope. All right, but uh, I'm actually being interrupted by the image there, which is very interesting that image would interrupt text in such a blatant way. We also see that there's some text in the back line here, and this has emphasis as well. Why would we take a poem and interrupt it with image and then interrupt it with more words? And I do believe that that's because it's meant to be the metaphor for how interrupted uh, the Black femme is when they're saying something important. They are interrupted by the news. They are interrupted by um, other people's conceptions of who they are. They are interrupted by life and going to work and different things like that. And so I thought that was a very uh, well done page. And this is gonna be available. So if you wanna take a good look at the pages, you can look at it later on the line. I said on the line, but I mean online. <laughs> um, so the next one we're going to look at is these are photos from the new book from Just Us. I just got my, my Just Us copy, so you should definitely get one from Book People. These images are printed on acid-free gloss paper, which means the each and every single page is very nice to the hand. Uh, it's very soft. Um, you feel like every page is important. And that's a part of the experience of, of art, right? It's not just what we read and how that uh, attaches us, but like, what does the book make me feel? Do I feel like this is important? Do I feel like this is cheap? Do I feel like this was done with care? Each page is made to be, uh, to made to feel as though it was done with care. This is actually a painting. I was a little surprised. Uh, Titus Kaffer painted this oil on canvas. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a collage, but no, it's oil on, on canvas, very talented. And I wanna point out this red dot in the upper right-hand corner of the image. There's a little red dot there. And when I first started reading this, uh, this book, I wasn't sure what the red dot was supposed to emphasize. And then I looked over here and I saw it again on a whole nother page. Here's a red dot and here's a red dot in the upper right-hand corners and lower right-hand corners uh, of, the, of the same book. We see it in different parts of the book, little red dots. And I wanted to know the significance of the red dot, right? Now we're taking it past the, the verbal, we're taking it past what is being said. 
to look at what the creation and the composition is trying to tell us about meaning for this book. This book was composed by John Lucas, which is, uh, I believe that's Marin King's husband. Uh, so they work very closely together. This is also something to note. These pages, which you can't see, they're a little bit different colored than the regular pages in the book. But these pages are, are scans. And it looks like you're looking at the page that's behind it, but you're not. You're looking at a, a photo, essentially a, a full fleshed photo in the book that then shows us poems that have blacked out portions. Uh, this is an erasure. And what's significant about the erasure is that uh, the erasure has been reprinted and then it has been, instead of us seeing black outlines, we see that it's been erased with white, which is a conversation again, that Claudia Rankine is having, not just in, uh, in Citizen, but in Justice as well, the uh, white erasure of black people, black lives, um, and black words. And so I thought that was interesting to include. Now I get all the way to, to this page over here on the right hand side. Um, finally, I've got an idea of what the red dots that I've been seeing on the last few pages could potentially mean. This poem is not included in the first, uh, in the first section of the book. It is included several, several sections in. Um, but finally, I have this, this black lettering, and then I have the red what if. Now, I can now look at every single piece after this, and I can go back and get and go, what is, maybe that's why the red dots are located here. Now, I haven't had a conversation with Claudia, but I'm assuming that that's what that means. Every time I see a red dot, I'm meant to interpret it as what if. And these are hints that you can leave as a writer, that you can leave as a visual artist, because it was a visual artist who helped to create this, these pieces in, the, in this particular presentation. Um, but these are, so, these are small things that will help your reader to determine uh, meaning. Now, this is John Lucas. Uh, there are five short films that you can definitely check out from uh, John Lucas. I put the link there so that you can have a, a chance to go look at them yourselves in your free time. We don't have enough day, enough time for me to go over everything I would like to go over about this. So it says, as a writer working with someone with a different skill set, I was given access to a kind of seeing that is highly developed in the visual artist and that I don't rely on as intuitively. My search for meaning what do you think that means is often countered with did you see that from john that kind of close looking the ability to freeze the frame challenges the language of the script to meet the moment literally second by second in the zidane world cup piece for example to know as the moment knows and not from outside and so this is from an interview with claudia rankin and lauren berlant from bomb magazine uh, in 2014 and we get a, a little bit of a glimpse into how Claudia is thinking about creating text that is combined with images and video. When you go to take a look at the short films, you'll see that Claudia is reading poems and that the films are, are focused on certain images uh, similar to what you see in the books. So the next guy we have here is Terrence Hayes. Uh, it says, engage in contemporary modalities. If you want to be drawn, one Stuart Ford plan would be to draw yourself, as Hayes has done. Change the word to represent it, and the political meanings of his title become clear. Hayes is Black. In American poetry, if a Black person wants to exist at all, he can either submit to representation by white artists or choose to portray himself. Now, I, as, a, as a Black artist, I do, uh, I do uh, align with this idea but I wanted to be clear that it's, a, it's about any identity, right? If you are a mother and you want people to know about uh, motherhood, then sometimes you have to define for yourself what motherhood looks like. And that's not always gonna be the definition that other people try to give to you. Sometimes you see images um, that don't necessarily align with your experience. And so that's your opportunity to create images that do align with your experience. Now we're going to take a look at how the person who's known primarily for his poetry, uh, what he's done with visual art. This is a self-portrait of Terence Hayes. Um, I want to emphasize the 
painters, painters in our group, I'm sure you can tell, there are a lot of deep, uh, large lines and a large strokes um, that help to create this image. It's not nece necessarily meant to be all fine tuned. It, it's very, um, <sighs> it feels very emotional to me when, when taking a look at this, at, at this painting. And that's something that's very interesting considering that this poet is known primarily for the writing. Um, the tone that I get from the writing is being replicated in the image itself. And we can see that in several of the images. These are all from Terrence Hayes's websites. Oh, <laughs> I apologize for this part right here. I'll get that fixed for you. Um, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be there. But uh, this here is the featured cover for Tiana Clark's 2018 debut poetry collection. Can't talk about the trees without the blood. Um, this image is supposed to be of Nina Simone. And I wanna note that like everything is dripping. And even though, you know, this might be a hint at blood, it doesn't necessarily look like it's meant to be bloody, but you do see a lot of drippage, which leads back to uh, the song that Nina Simone is famous for. We've got a painting of Tupac Shakur here. I do not know the titles of these paintings. Again, I don't know Terrence personally, so I did not have time to call him and ask him. <laughs> um, who, the names of these of these paintings, but you can view them on his website along with several other images. Uh, let's go to the next one. Is there we go? This is a video um, from Terence's last book was American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. The book is full of sonnets, all titled American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. And when I was doing research on his artwork, I noted that he has an entire Vimeo um, uh, collection of sonnets. And the sonnets are not regular sonnets, the sonnets are actually video. So this is one of the sonnets that uh, he has created. I do know that Terrence Hayes wears a watch on each wrist. And when I was wondering if this was actually Terrence, if you if you see in the video later, you might see that he's wearing a, a watch on each wrist. So I do think that this is Terrence dancing. Think I see it now. Time to be it now. What you dream about? Can you see us now? Yeah, I'm screaming now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can feel it now. Simple spirit now. Can you hear it now? And I can show you how. I can show you now. Can you say it loud? Can you show us all your power? 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 I'm gonna show you all my power. 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 Think you see it now. Turn the beat. So that's just a short clip of of that video. What I want to note about this that makes it interesting and that makes it interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary is the dancing the video element. We also see what looks like a, a metaphor for the black man in America, which is just all black clothing and uh, a generic mask. So now what we're looking at is the interpretation of the poem. The video itself is a poem, which changes, uh, which changes the possibilities for writers. What could be a novel? Can I make, uh, and I, I like to do this all the time, this is how I think of things. What else could be a novel? Could I create an entire menu of food from um, my childhood and create that and call it a novel? Uh, could I create, you know, um, one long, long, long video <laughs> and call that a novel? And as you can see here, 
um, Terrence has created a video that's about three minutes long, and that is his novel, or that is his poem. So that's something you can also take a look at. This next artist, Jesse Crimes, is not necessarily a poet, um, but I have had a chance to work with Jesse. This is actually a photo I took of Jesse Crimes last year. Uh, he has created something that is pretty spectacular, so I love to tell people about it. Though Crimes' techniques and style are modern, his work falls partially into the category of folk art. The quilts reflect the Amish and Mennonite traditions specific to Lancaster, and the corn mazes are common there as well. By using local art forms and traditions, Crimes said he wanted to reach an audience that is increasingly affected by incarceration. Major cities are cutting incarceration rates, while rural communities' incarceration rates are going through the roof, he said. Racial disparities are the most drastic in these smaller communities. We all have a stake in reversing that. Now, um, what he has created is an entire corn maze and a quilt series that tells the story of people who have been incarcerated like crimes himself. Uh, and it includes many conversations. There are parts that I, I really enjoyed that I'm gonna show you now. These are more photos that I took of the maze. I actually went into the maze myself I had never been in a corn maze. This is in Lancaster, uh, Philadelphia. I'd never been in a corn maze and this is my first time in a corn maze. And what I wanna note is this long entrance is representative of all the long entrances that are taken throughout the maze. And it's meant to help each individual person feel the solitary life um, that happens when you go into the carceral system. It's you by yourself walking in to a system that you don't understand and that you can't find your way out of. And uh, Crimes has created that sensation, that actual feeling and um, the act of traveling through the system very well with this maze. As you can see, the first item here is the wrong way, which is an installation. This is the actual size of a cell um, that, he, that he stayed in. Um, I personally have also stayed in the cell of this size. And it's, it's obviously not pretty to be in a room this small and sometimes for weeks, months, or years at a time. Uh, I was only in the jail for 45 days, but crimes, I believe, spent 15 years uh, in, the, in the system. And so this was his personal experience that he was trying to share with us. These are several of the quilts from the project. As you can see, they're very large. This barn is amazing. I actually had a chance to be in the barn as well. Um, we did a conversation, a Q&A with Piper Kerman, uh, who is the author of Orange is the New Black. And what you can see on this side of the wall here, on the left the left hand side, is a map. And that map documents the journey of incarceration in Lancaster, Philadelphia over time. Um, and what you can see is this red line that's at the top is the history of black incarceration and the yellow line on the bottom is, oh, sorry, the blue line on the bottom is the history of incarceration for uh, white people in the same community. And you can see that there's a big disparity between the both of them. And this is based off of data and metrics that were put together by Vera Institute of Social Justice. So he combined data he combined actual uh, experiences from other people who had been previously incarcerated, and he combined uh, the people who knew the people who were previously incarcerated. Very often, uh, family members and uh, neighbors and caretakers are deeply impacted by their loved one going to jail or prison, most often for misdemeanor offenses for long periods of time. And so Jesse Crime, talked to those people and he took their stories down and he created them and he helped put them into images. Uh, this is the North Star, which is one of the quilts that's included. It's this one that you can see in the image on the right-hand side there. Um, and so that's, that's fairly amazing because now we've got storytelling, oral tradition turning into literally quilts. The quilts are very important to the Amish communities. They, that's how they raise money very often is to create quilts. And so he included uh, the practices of the local community members into his creation, uh, which added another depth to it to really make it about place. So that is one item there. 
uh, I didn't want to take up too much more time. So now we're going to swing through our last few artists. The C.A. Conrad uh, is Portrait Undone. They are uh, fairly hilarious. This is one of my favorite photos of them. Their project that they won a Creative Capital Award for. If you are an artist and you are combining any two art forms together, you should apply to Creative Capital. Their awards are open in February of every year. They offer $50,000 in direct support, as well as an additional $50,000 in um, additional support when it comes to like, you know, uh, services and mentorship and things like that to, uh, I think it's upwards of 50 people per year or 50 projects per year. So excellent opportunity to get funding for your project. Um, this is the project that won CA Conrad the award resurrect instinct vibration is a somatic poetry ritual in nine maneuvers including lying on the ground across the u.s to saturate their body with recordings of recently extinct animals and strategic placing index cards in public with email correspondences for each animal to result in a total of 108 poems and this is a map of of the locations that ca is planning on going to it's fairly epic. I would not have come up with this at all by myself. Um, I think that it's extremely imaginative, which is one of the reasons why it did win uh, $50,000 to be created. It's extremely imaginative. And so it's important to know that there's no limit to what you can create. Um, we're going to go to the next one. Reginald Dwayne uh, Betts. I met Reggie back in spoken word days. Uh, really excellent poet. You may have heard of his newest collection, uh, Felon, which came out last year in 2019. This is a project he did with Titus Keffer, which is also uh, the artist that worked with Claudia Rankine. Betts utilizes the legal strategy of redaction to create verse out of legal documents, capturing the complicated and pervasive effects of time spent incarcerated. These poems have been screen printed by Kaffer onto handmade paper using the redaction font, a new open source typeface created for the project. Together, Betts' poems and Kaffer's printed portraits blend the voices of poet and artists with those of the plaintiffs and prosecutors, reclaiming these lost narratives and drawing attention to some of the many individuals whose lives have been impacted by mass incarceration. So I don't know if, if you knew this, but if you are a writer, you too can be inside of the Modern Museum of uh, Art. So this was, I thought, a really great example of how you could use language uh, and the love for the written word to translate it into a necrastic uh, ex example. And so these are images, the actual, uh, obviously the, the image of the man was created by Titus Kaffer, but the type font, which is the literal font of the words. It's a special font that they've created together. And then the language, of course, is from a document and uh, the poet has uh, done an erasure here. Excellent piece. Uh, I really wish I could go to MoMA to take a look at that, but I do not live near there. So I have to dream it up just like Rebecca Solnit. Uh, Rebecca Solnit is also an author uh, who created another project that I think is just really excellent. Not any atlas, mind you, but one as inventive and affectionate as Rebecca Solnit's Infinite City, a San Francisco atlas, a collection of 22 maps and accompanying essays paying homage to the city where the author lives. Infinite City started as a commissioned project for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which turned to Solnit as it geared up for its 75th anniversary this year. That is from an article um, in the New York Times, so book review for Infinite City. And this is an example of one of the maps that was created by Solnit. It's part collage, uh, part, part history making, or a rehistory making. There are comments and phrases uh, in these little boxes that I know are hard for you to see. It's, it's small screen, but uh, you can definitely look this up or just go buy the book and then you'll have the maps all for yourself. The next one we're going to look at is Worcestershire. Uh, Worcestershire is, I believe, from London. I might be, I might be exaggerating that. I know that, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're from London. Uh, Beyonce reads parts of Shire's poems. 
including for women who are difficult to love, the unbearable weight of staying, the end of the relationship, and Nell Technician as palm reader, and interludes between songs in her 12-track hour-long video album that premiered this week. Truly Shire was a brilliant choice for Beyonce's unapologetically Black and female album. Like the people and places from which they are woven, Shire's poems, published in a volume titled Teaching My Mother How to Give Birth, are laden with longing for other lands and complicated by the contradictions of belonging in new ones. Um, what's really interesting about this is that this is probably one of the most um, one of the most talked about integrations of poetry and image. And so I'm going to show you just a clip uh, from Beyonce's video that uh, in which she used uh, Warshenshire's poetry. Hey, this is some right after Thank this you commercial, you obviously. <laughs> voting in the future is now. So go to headcount.org to see how you can register to vote. Sorry, I didn't do that earlier. I didn't know I was going to play an ad. Okay. <laughs> I tried to change, closed my mouth door, tried to be soft, prettier, less awake. Fasted for 60 days, wore white, abstained from mirrors, abstained from sex, slowly did not speak another word. In that time, my hair, I grew past my ankles. I slept on a mat on a floor. I swallowed a sword. I levitated, went to the basement, confessed my sins and was baptized in a river got on my knees and said amen and said I mean. I whipped my own back and asked for dominion at your feet. I threw myself into a volcano. I drank the blood and drank the wine. I sat alone and begged and bent at the waist for God. I crossed myself and thought I saw the devil. I grew thick in skin on my feet. I bathed in bleach and plugged my menses with pages from the holy book, but still inside me coiled deep was the need to know. Are you cheating? Cheating? Are you cheating on me? So that is an example of combining images, um, very significant images, with with words. This is our last artist that we're going to look at. Daniel McCarthy Clifford um, is another artist from the Re Writer Return Project. Uh, I believe he was in the first cycle for the for the fellowship. Together, they compiled the section of disapproved books housed in the Target Studio that includes the titles in the library catalog that are banned in US incarceration facilities. McCarthy Clifford is interested in the way his art and his personal experience of incarceration can be combined with academic research to better highlight the US prison system with the goal to change its practices. So in this case, the artist did not write any books. Uh, the artist did not necessarily create a sculpture, um, but they did do something that's a little bit about erasure. All of the books that are banned from prisons and from jails, um, all of those titles have been brought to a, a particular space and curated for people who have access to them to read. Um, and what's significant about that is, you know, what does that say about the American carceral system that these books that we have access to that we can read, uh, what about those books has, you know, um, has really encouraged people to want to ban them from people who are on the inside. And so it's a very interesting conversation to have about how can you create a conversation with your audience, with your art. Perhaps it is just collecting. Um, I, there's a house that's nearby where I live here in San Marcos, Texas, and it's covered in red hens. And maybe a couple of red hens would have not have been like an artistic statement but when your whole house is red and your whole yard is covered in red hens of every size, uh, if your balcony and your, your porch are covered in red hens and your backyard is covered in red hens, now we're making a statement, an artistic statement, um, and we're communicating something to our passerbys. And so that's something to think about. What are the different ways that you can communicate an idea that isn't necessarily literal, 
uh, but that does have a conversation component to it. So this, uh, there are two images from my collection. These are not necessarily the ones that have been exhibited, but these are two from a project that I'm working on. Um, the first one is called hashtag turnt. Uh, it is a self portrait. Both of these are self portraits. Um, and this one is having a conversation about, um, honestly, the, 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 all the protest against um, police brutality. And then this one here, Scream, is uh, just kind of thinking about all the things that have happened uh, in my life and how difficult it can be to communicate an idea. I actually went to Arizona. I drove out to the middle of nowhere in Arizona's desert and got out of the car and took several photos. And this is one of them. Um, so here, here's my contact information. If you would like more information about me, you can go to my website, www.felitahicks.com. I am on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all the same. Uh, and I want to thank the Writers League of Texas for hosting this event and uh, the Right of Return USA for their continued support of previously incarcerated artists um, as they have helped me to have space and time to think about how to connect my writing with images, video, and music. So now I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. So much, Faylita. That was such an incredible presentation. I have so many artists that I now need to have to go like look up and read and look at all of their art too. Um, and so we're opening up the floor for questions now. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I will read them out loud and Faylita will answer. Um, I do embroidery, bookbinding, painting and drawing. I'm very curious how others are doing the mixed arts and hoping to get some guidance on how to do it all while working full time. Um, so this is a very interesting question. Uh, the, that's a lot of different things to put together <laughs> into one project. Um, my advice, because I'm one of those people, right? I like to put every, how many different ways can I create a project? Um, what I would say is break them up into each category. Uh, so let the embroidery be the embroidery. Do the embroidery until the embroidery is done. Do the painting. Do as many paintings as you need to, but do the painting until it's done. And then go to the next part, bookbinding. Um, breaking it up can help a lot. If you go through your regular work week and you're working a regular 40 hours, um, I, I, in the pandemic, apparently people are working 50 and 60 hours, but if you're working a regular schedule, um, setting aside one to two hours every day to just focus on one thing can be very helpful and understand that you don't have to get it done by any particular time. I can be very hard on myself and say, Ooh, I have to have this done by October 1st, but no one told me I have to have it done by October 1st, except for me. It's okay if it takes longer, especially if you are working full time and you have a life and you do other things. It's okay if it doesn't uh, happen right away. I do think that uh, that would be very interesting. I would love to see a painting that has embroidery included with it. Uh, textures and fabrics are very amazing. And there's actually a grant that I think is, is available for textures. And I'm gonna look that up while we look at the next question. Awesome. Um, I don't see any more questions, but Jo Salazar says that she wanted to say that this has been amazing and thank you. So thank you to you, Kaylita. Awesome, thank you. Tammy, uh -huh. yeah? I was gonna say if you had any questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering how so you also have like a sp spoken word album that accompanies your actual like poetry book. And so I'm wondering how that came about and if you wrote the poetry book knowing that you were gonna, you know, do that spoken word album with it. Absolutely. So that the album that came out, Onyx, that is included with uh, Hood Witch yeah. is my third spoken word album. So I started with spoken word. I was not necessarily writing to put it on a page. I was writing to perform. And that is its own special area. A lot of poems that work on the stage can also work on the page. But when I was writing, I was writing specifically for the, for the stage. 
And so um, Hoodwitch being my first full collection that was going to be out in the world, I wanted the album to be representative of where I come from and where I'm going. Um, and the I don't think I'm done with it. I'm pretty sure there are some videos I still have to make for it. I know we're reaching a year next month for Hoodwitch, but I might still end up making videos <laughs> to go with the poems. Yeah, that is so cool. Um, so we have a question from Ivana. Ivana is wondering, how do you feel like adding mixed media into your own work has added to your poetry or the way that you express yourself? In other words, how has it benefited you as an artist? That's a great question. Um, so the project that I'm working on now is definitely looking at texture and looking at space. I wanted to create the experience of driving from uh, San Marcos, Texas, all the way to uh, Los Angeles County, California. And if you've ever taken that drive, it is extremely long. And there are lots of places where you're sure that there's not gonna be a gas station anytime soon and you might need it and you'll be stuck in the desert. Uh, it's a very long, empty drive, right? You get, a, you get to see a lot of land, a lot of mountains. Mm -hmm. And so when I was working on one of my new poems, uh, it's called A Map of My Want. And I wanted to really think about what a map of my want is. And I've realized that halfway through, um, halfway through creating my, my piece, um, as a poem and structuring it as a map on the page, I realize I'm going to need an actual map. So now I have to find the right map and then I have to figure out how am I going to put this on like on, on sheet? What does it look like in the final creation? I, I like my books, um, but there are some books on here that are very large. Um, for example, like Vanessa's, Vanessa's book here, Beast Meridian. The book is beautiful. It's also very large in comparison to like Citizen, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that has to do with space. That has to do with um, the need for space to create some of the, some of the, the spatial things that are happening on the page, right? And I was like, oh no, my book is going to be huge for no apparent reason because I have to include an entire map. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but that's definitely an endeavor that I'm doing because I realize a poem only wants to be on a map. I can try to make it fit the standards of the industry for publishing, or I could let the poem live how the poem wants to live, which is on a map. And that's, that, those are things that have happened in my brain now. Like, am I just trying to fit this poem into one page because I want it to get published? Or am I letting the piece speak to itself? and uh, letting it live as it could live. Yeah. Wow, that's so inspiring. It sounds like there's this like freedom that comes with knowing, you know, like I don't have to abide by these like constrictions or whatever it is that publishing says that you have to do to like be published. You know, I think that that's so cool. Yeah. Um, okay, and so let's see, we have another question from Layla. She says, absolutely brilliant and inspiring. I'd love to hear more in the spirit of that last question. As you are branching out into different disciplines, do you take classes in different crafts like photography or do you explore on your own? I explore my own. Um, that being said, for photography, I am working primarily, I say primarily, I'm only working with my cell phone. Uh, I did invest with the fellowship that I got, I was able to invest in the newest iPhone which comes with the ability to change like, you know, the ISOs and, you know, focusing on the subjects. I can do all the fancy cami work, camera work, but with my cell phone, which is super awesome. Cause I don't have to spend thousands of dollars to get a device that I do have to learn when I could just use the thing that's in my back pocket that does all my work for me. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's super helpful. I do do a lot of reading about how to shoot video and how to shoot uh, movies and different things with a cell phone. Um, I've learned a ton of things. Uh, I'm working on a documentary that's also related to the same project and uh, knowing that I can create quality footage that could live on the large screen. I could take it to a film festival if I wanted to. It's fairly amazing and I only learned that because of the other people who are doing that work. I do a lot of Google. Me and Google are friends. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think if there are any classes I've actually taken for 
I don't think I've taken any classes. I will say I am on master class. So I did invest in master class because I'm never going to get a chance to ask, ask some of those people questions, but I can at least like, you know, watch some videos and learn something from that in YouTube. Oh yeah. I love YouTube. <laughs> cool. And so we have another question from Mia, who is our awesome board member. And Mia says, I look to a lot of other artists for inspiration, but then get wrapped up in how good their work is and get pretty discouraged. How can I make something that good? Says their anxiety of rain. How do you stay inspired and motivated to tell your story? That is another great question. <laughs> Because it is very difficult. Um, I actually got this fellowship that I'm in right now back in uh, April of this year. And it has taken up until last month before I knew what I was going to do with my project. Because I had seen the work of Reginald Dwayne Betts, who had the fellowship. I'd seen the work of Jesse Crimes, who had the fellowship. I was like, I don't know if I can do what they did. I, I'm pretty sure I can't do what they did. Um, but the message I hadn't learned was that I wasn't supposed to do what they were doing. I'm supposed to do what I need to do. What's the wildest dream I've ever had? And how, how deep can I get into that wildest dream I've ever had? Um, which has opened up a lot for me and um, inspired me a lot. I think just seeing what's possible with, with the least amount of things is helpful. Um, I made the video that's at the beginning of the presentation with my cell phone and uh, iMovie. And it's a full like short film. It was in a film fest and all that other fun stuff. And I was like, I don't need to have the fancy materials. I don't need to have the fancy camera. I don't need to have the fancy sound to make it happen. I can make this video happen with or without your help, um, you know, from a fellowship or something like that. But now I've got the fellowship. And now I've got even more tools to use. And so um, I think just really looking at what other people are doing, how they're challenging themselves and knowing that I don't have to have all the right tools to get started. Wow, yeah, definitely. Um, next question. So Laurel Sienna says, writing is my primary medium and I have confidence in my ability to edit so it is presentable to the world at large. As to my other talents, I'm afraid they'd be met with what the hell was she thinking if I attempted to combine them with my written words. Can you please comment on how your mixing of art media changed your internal editor? Yeah, um, I can be very full of words. Like I, I tend to write a whole lot and I have to go back and just start stripping them. I think what happened with images is I started thinking about what's the one word I could put on this image or what's one word I could have here in this image that would bring forth the idea I want you to have. What's gonna add to the image? And if nothing adds to the image, then I don't need to put anything there, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it needs to be a separate piece that's accompanied by the image, like with some of Claudia, Claudia's work, Claudia isn't necessarily writing on the image. It's just juxtaposed with the, with the image which is one way to approach it. Um, and then there are other ways when you see lots of words on top of words, on top of words, on top of words, when you're reading it, especially if you're like a reader or writer, you start getting excited and you start going, whoa, 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 too much, too much, too much. But that's what the artist was trying to do, was trying to make you feel that. Um, if I'm going to put images and words together directly, I'm gonna have to really think about what those words are. It can't just be any words. It can't be just to take up space. You know, what, why am I putting that there? What's its value? And um, how is it adding to the, to the message I originally had for this? Right now, I'm really focused on space and distance. And so there's a lot of white space in my work, a lot of white space. <laughs> and it's a little scary. Because I keep wanting to put even more white space. I was like, no, but if I put too much, then I'm not going to know that that's still the poem. Yeah. Um, but that's something I'm going to have to deal with. <laughs> that's interesting. Do you think that your words come to you first and then you sort of like expand or think, oh, no, like I can juxtapose this with an image or, you know, in a video or something like that? It's definitely words first. Cool. 
um, definitely words first. Um, to be perfectly honest, I have outlines for a whole set of images that I haven't even started working on. Uh, my project is supposed to be due in December. <laughs> haven't even started working on the images, but that's because I've been so focused on cultivating the words and making sure that I've said what I need to say. Um, Cause then I will support the, I will build the images that will support the words mm -hmm. and to give me another way to share that idea, so. God, that's so interesting. Um, okay, so we have another question from Stephanie. I'm interested in the idea of overlaying photos with poetry. Is that something journals and magazines would consider for publication? Absolutely. Um, Tri Quarterly is the one that published uh, Claudia Rankine's video with um, Josh Klein. I think I said that right. I, I might have said that wrong. With Claudia's husband. <laughs> <laughs> they have a video that was posted on Tricordly. Uh, 521 Magazine loves work that is hybrid. Um, I know that there are several publications that are looking for hybrid work. I'm trying to remember that off the top of my head. There are publications that will definitely publish your work uh, that's hybrid. Paris Review just had a poem come from Allison Rollins, I believe. Uh, I think I have that copy. Is it right here? No, it's not. It's an erasure of a report um, about Mike Brown, I believe, that Allison Rollins has done. Uh, and it's, it's an image. So it's not the words repented on the page. It's an actual image, which means it probably was scanned, um, and which is it, itself art. So like if you were able to do an image with the words, well, Paris Review is hard, but possible. <laughs> Hard, but possible. It's all possible. <laughs> cool. So Amanda Zapp is asking, do you know of any artists combining poetry and costume slash clothing design? That is a great question. Um, I'm thinking of, of, of several designers, but I'm not sure if anyone is combining poetry with clothing design. I love fashion. So if you can make poems, with clothes. There is a journal, I don't know if they're still working, like I, I don't know if they're still publishing or not, but there is one journal where you had to submit a project of poems that were going to be on materials. So it could be like, I want to write a poem that's a pair of jeans. I want to write a poem that's um, a locket box. I want to write a poem that's, um, we know that there are sev several poems that are like pill bottles. Um, there was a journal and that's that's how they sent it out was like maybe 50 copies because obviously it's one item that has whatever the poem is on it um wow i really should have come with all my journals names in my head but they do exist i know they exist <laughs> <laughs> we can maybe do some research and send some out to everyone afterwards um i'm putting in here a, a link for uh grant that is available and this one is a craft research fund it's twenty thousand um, dollars to work on crafts cool. so it is an application process and i do not know anyone who works for it so i won't be good to ask questions for that <laughs> but it is there for people who are working specifically on crafts awesome and so this will be our last question for the day Roberta says, there are a lot of projects that seem to deal with pain, with injustice, with various forms of angst. Are you aware of comparable projects that may deal with joy, whether received from the environment or from some event or type of content? That's a great question. And I know that there are projects that do that. Um, I, here's what I'll say. And I'm having this conversation uh, with my wonderful agent. <laughs> We're talking about trying to find uh, joy in all the pain. How do you bring joy forth from all the pain? Um, especially with the pandemic, a lot of people have lost people. A lot of people have lost their homes, their jobs. Um, you know, a lot of things have gone wrong for people this year. And readers at this point, they don't want to read any more bad news. They want to read happy things, things that are going to provide them encouragement and inspiration and things like that. Um, but I believe that a lot of joy that can be found can only be found 
after going after having experienced significant sadness right don't make yourself feel sad if you're not feeling sad if things aren't bad don't make them bad but if you have experienced deep sadness then you will experience deep joy at some point um and i find joy in everything that i've shared i found joy or delight in the image or in the work itself um i was looking at Claudia's work while I was trying to put together this presentation. I was like, man, there's so much white page. And then I was like, okay, what does it mean that everything we ever look at inside of a museum is on a white backdrop? Every museum you go to, every art gallery you go to, everything is on a white backdrop. What does that say about our view of art? And, you know, what would happen if we were to make it a black drop? And of course that's you know just the juxtaposition of it but what would happen if it was a black drop and then i looked at reginald Dwayne betts and that backdrop is a black it's a black page and then we get the drawing and i was like oh okay thank you that's what i was wondering is what how how would i experience that and so i think that you can find joy um even in work that is hard that is serious um there's definitely joy to be had I can tell you a lot of the books that are banned from prisons and jails are pretty funny books, pretty, um, they're, they're commentary and some of them are funny commentaries and you're like, why wouldn't that be allowed? Mm -hmm. I don't understand, why wouldn't you allow that? Um, so there, I think it's all depending on your perspective about what's joyful. You could also go to Creative Capital. Again, I think Creative Capital is amazing. Creative Capital has a catalog of all of the artists they have awarded and the titles of their projects and the descriptions of their projects. And some of them are pretty amazing. Some of them are focused on joy. Some of them are focused on the environment specifically. Um, I'm not sure if you had heard of the people who, if they have an option, if they get buried, they can be buried in the tree. Does anybody remember that? There, there was a commercial that was happening at one point. It was like, you know, alternatives to um, afterlife. And, you know, you could be buried beneath a tree and this is the process. That was a creative capital grant. Um, and they created a whole new system of burial, which is pretty amazing. That leads to life, so, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so, so much, Felita, for this awesome presentation. Um, that is it for tonight, but if anyone has any last comments or questions, you can just put them in the chat box. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I had a good time. Thank you.